Stand with me, please. Good morning, everybody. And I do want to take time. This is a first for our choir and musicians to have to sing with masks. Even the horns have masks on them. But I think they did a marvelous job today. I appreciate it so much. And brothers and sisters, I know things are changing. Everything is in flux. What we thought was solid isn't, and even people we thought we could depend on, we couldn't. But let me tell you what really matters. The one person and the one thing that really matters has not changed one bit and never will change. The Lord Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the Bible I'm going to preach out of today says, though we have not yet seen him, we rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Hang on a minute. I've never seen him. I've never had a vision of him. I don't know what color he is. I don't know how tall he is. I don't know what he weighs. I have no idea what Jesus would look like if he walked in the back door. But I know he's alive and I know he's my savior. And I think I'll just take a moment and rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You made me so happy today, Lord. Thank you. You've given us such peace and purpose. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And I pray today, Lord, as we hear your word, again, I, I, there's no way one man can say everything that needs to be said to every ear and heart. But, but you, Lord, you can take fish and bread and break it and distribute it so that everyone gets exactly what they need and plenty of it. Do that with your word today. For those who are watching at home, bless them. And, and you know, I thought there may be lots of people on the road right now watching. Uh, don't take your eyes off the wheel or off the road, I should say. Uh, just listen. But God bless you as you listen on the phone or on the iPad or whatever kind of pad. You may be seated. I, I pray a great deal about what to preach. I don't go off and get a number of sermons for the next six months. I don't plan my sermons weeks or months in advance. I'm one of those strange guys that believes that God has a rhema word, a right now word. And so I pray a great deal about what to say to you. And as I was praying yesterday, I felt a strong leading, an urge to preach to you this message about the Holy Spirit. Now, I didn't know where it was going, but again, I, I've learned to trust that inner witness I also know that the subject of the Holy Spirit is so vast, so deep. If you preached on the Holy Spirit for 10 years, you would not cover the person and work of this third member of the Godhead. So the Lord spoke to my heart and the Spirit led me to this passage of Scripture that I'll get to. But I want to make an observation. Um, we learned a long time ago that we're supposed to be uh, soul winners. We're supposed to witness to people. And, you know, for years we had tracts and we would give them out. And then, of course, in our services we give altar calls. And if you want to be saved, you come down. And when one comes down, we always have altar workers, people trained, prepared, 
and they will have some material. They will have a scripture. They might even say, um, do you believe this scripture that whosoever believes on the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, on and on and on. And people look at it and they say, I believe that. And so we ask again. So you read this. Jesus is the Son of God. He forgives people of their sins. Do you accept him as your Savior? And they say, yes. You believe this? Yes. And then we, um, in some way or another, declare that they have been saved or born again. We ask them, do you believe? And they say, yes. And I, in recent weeks in my prayers and studies believe that while that is good there is an element missing it's an element that I call the witness of the spirit it's not just a reception of a scripture in your head but the Holy Spirit comes into your heart if it's head only, it won't last. But if it comes into your heart, then a deep and abiding work will take place. So in the church I grew up in, uh, there was a man there who could neither read nor write. But he got saved and if I ever saw a man, as long as we were in that church, serve God faithfully and worship tearfully and rejoice and, and win people to Christ himself, we saw that man do it. And he couldn't read the Bible. He heard a preacher tell him he could be born again and he believed it. But... He couldn't study the Bible. This was long before they had the Bible on tape or record or anything. So my question is, without this uh, daily study of Scripture, how did this man live such a fruitful life? It's, it's the witness of the Spirit. In communist countries, we've been told, where it's forbidden to have a Bible. Bibles are smuggled in and underground churches get them. And they will tear a page out and pass the Bible on to someone else who will also tear a page out. And they will pass that Bible around different underground church groups. And although they have only a page, maybe even half a page. There is a strength, a faith, a commitment to Christ that, that is almost not seen in American Christianity. Now, how can they with such little Bible knowledge live such strong, bold lives for Jesus? Now, you know, I preach from this pulpit often. Oh, yes, and I believe it. We ought to delve into God's Word every day. We ought to eat it, know it. But there's something to be considered when people who don't have that privilege can live overcoming and victorious lives. Now, what's the secret to that? It's the witness of the Spirit of God. Because you don't just get the word in your head, you get the spirit in your heart. Jesus said, it's the spirit that quickens, the flesh profits nothing. The word that I say unto you are spirit and life. So there is a life that gives the word its invigorating, transforming power. It's the Holy Spirit. If you go to the book of Acts chapter 10 and you go to the house of a man named Cornelius, he's a Roman 
soldier and the house is full of Roman people, not Jews, Romans, they have no Bible, they have no scripture, they have no New Testament, they don't even have the Hebrew scriptures. And yet the Spirit of God led Peter to that house and they were sitting there waiting on him. And the Bible says while Peter preached the word, the Holy Spirit fell on all them which heard the word. And then they were baptized. They spoke in tongues and were baptized in water later. Well, folks, they didn't have a Bible. Peter didn't come with a load of New Testaments. All he did was preach and they received it. And that house began a movement in, it, in that entire country that has not stopped until this very day. So how can they not have scripture, not have a Bible, and yet be so vibrant in the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ? Because they received the Spirit. Please let us not be guilty of just having a mental understanding of Jesus or an intellectual reception of scripture and not be changed and touched and fired and transformed by the Holy Spirit of God. Now you have to understand, we're living in the most blessed time in history. You do know that, don't you? The prophets longed to see the day we are in. Each prophet had a piece of the puzzle of truth, not the whole puzzle, just a piece of it. And wherever they went, they preached that piece of the puzzle. But today, we not only have the puzzle, we have the box top that shows us what it's going to look like when it's over. And we have the privilege of operating in a power that those prophets did not operate in. I'm about to get happy already. Man, this feels good. Uh, when John the Baptist uh, baptized people in water, Jesus made this comment about him. Of men born of women, there has not been one greater than John the Baptist. He was the greatest prophet of all. But Jesus said, yet, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. Now, I hope you hear what I just said to you. John the Baptist exceeded Elijah, Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah. He was the epitome of a prophet. He closed out the prophetic era. And yet Jesus said, the least believer in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. Brother, you don't realize where you stand right now. He was talking about you and me when he said that. He is saying that the experience we have is greater than the prophets had. The, the power we have is greater than the power the prophets had. We are living in the kingdom of God. This is the church of the living God. We've been born of the Spirit. God's Spirit's been poured out. The power of the Lord is in us. It walks among us. It does mighty things through us. And we ought to live and rejoice every day in the fact that God's been better to us than any other generation in history. So then right after the resurrection, Jesus meets with his disciples. Now, the first time he met with them, Thomas was not there because Thomas was depressed. He felt like a fool. He had all of his dreams dashed. He was disappointed in himself, disappointed in the other apostles. He was disappointed in Jesus, and he was angry with God. But he decided to show up with those other apostles. And when he did, they said, you will not believe this, Thomas. We saw Jesus. He is alive. And Thomas said, I will not believe it until I with my own eyes see the nail prints in his hand and the scar in his side. And about that time, Jesus showed up and said, Thomas, take a look. Thomas, take a look. 
And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said, Thomas, because you have seen, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen him. I'm going to yell. I can't help it. Blessed are those who have not seen him and yet have believed. Let me preach a little bit right here. I have not seen him. You have not seen him. I don't know anything about him. I repeat myself. If he were to walk in the door, I don't know that I would know him, but I know this. I believe him. I believe he's the son of God. I believe he raised the dead. I believe he walked on water. I believe he had power over nature. I believe that when he died, he took my sins to the cross. I believe he rose again. I believe he ascended up into heaven. And I believe he's coming back again. I believe. Well, Jesus was saying to Thomas, a day is coming when my people won't have to have proof because they will have an inner witness. They won't need visual external proof. They will have an internal power. There will be an inside evidence. And so when John stood in that Jordan and he was baptizing by the thousands he lifted up his voice and said, I indeed baptize you with water. But there is one coming after me who was before me, whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. John said, I dip you in the water, by the way, if you go back far enough in the Greek, instead of John the Baptist, he was actually called John the Plunger. It's true. John the Plunger. Because when people came and confessed their sins, John the Baptist plunged them in the water and brought them back up, therefore testifying that they had repented of their sins and their life is different now. John said, I'm doing it in water but somebody's coming who's going to do it in the spirit. They're going to, he will plunge you in the spirit as deeply and powerfully as I've plunged you into the water. Now, of course, we make, every Sunday here, we make a big deal out of the cross of Jesus. There it is. Over the years, I've been advised by people, take the cross down. You might win more people. Take the cross down, it's offensive. Take the cross down, Jews might come. Take the cross down and, and make it a little more acceptable and accessible to everybody. My answer is, it'll never come down. I'm not ashamed of the cross. Wait now. I'm already getting off my subject. Y'all know. Don't. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You say, well, if, if, if it offends Jews, they're not going to come to church. If you're Jewish, at some point, you're going to have to stare the cross in the face. You're going to have to come to grips with your Jewish brother dying on an old rugged cross. I won't take it down. I'm not ashamed of it. I won't quit preaching about it. It was on a hill far away that an old rugged cross stood. And there my sins were paid for once and for all. Hallelujah to God. Then we make a big deal about the resurrection, as we should. When Jesus came out, he justified us. He declared us righteous and holy and acceptable in the eyes of God the Father. Hallelujah. Saved by the cross and the blood. Justified by an empty tomb. But we forget that 50 days later, something even more wonderful took place, if you can imagine that. Jesus marched his disciples and others to a hillside, a Mount of Olives. And as he was giving them final orders, as he commissioned them to go into all the world and preach the gospel, 
Yet, get this. Suddenly, he was taken up in a cloud and he disappeared out of their sight. He was gone. And as the apostles stared, the two angels said, why are you staring up into heaven? This same Jesus is coming back the same way he just left. Now, go get the job done. Well, brothers and sisters, I don't think the ascension of Jesus has gotten the appreciation. This is just me that, that it must have because Jesus sat with his disciples on the night that he was betrayed and said, I'm going to go away. Of course, they were upset about that. He said, well, well, wait, it's to your advantage that I go away. If I don't go away, the helper cannot come. If I go away, I will send him unto you. He will guide you into all the truth. He will bring all things to your remembrance that I have taught you. He will strengthen you. He will enable you. He will keep you by Holy Spirit power. So I'm going to leave. And when he did, he was taken up into a cloud and gone, disappeared, separated from them. But he had told them, now go wait in the city of Jerusalem until you be soaked with power from on high. So they went and they waited and they prayed for 10 days. And on the day of Pentecost, they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and they, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and cloven tongues of fire sat upon each of them and they spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And what we forget is that that experience was the proof, the evidence that Jesus had sat down at the right hand of the Father. His work was done. He had accomplished his mission. And now he took from the Father the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit, and he poured it down on the church on that day. And from that day to this, those who call on the name of the Lord can walk by the Spirit be filled with the Spirit, be empowered with the Spirit. So, so I want to take you to Romans chapter 8. And I'm going to take just a, a, a tasty tidbit out of the middle of this Romans chapter 8 and just show you what the Lord showed me yesterday about this gift called the Holy Spirit. I want to begin with verse number 13. Watch this. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Well, that's a stark statement, isn't it? And he's talking to Christians. So, brother, don't live according to the flesh. Sister, please do not live according to the flesh. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to help me Put away the evil deeds of my life. He doesn't expect me to do it on my own. I don't have the strength to do it. I don't have the stamina to do it. So Jesus sent him to help me. And if I call on him, trust in him, believe in him, I can put to death the deeds of my body. Brother, listen to me. You don't have to live in and out and up and down and half defeated most of the time. There is a victory in Jesus and this victory comes through the poured out Holy Spirit and he comes to you to give you the ability to say no to the things you used to be held in bondage to. To say no to sin that's trying to destroy your life. To say no to the devil that's trying to drag you down and ruin your inheritance. You, through the Holy Spirit, can say no. Say amen, somebody. <clears throat> Verse number 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. 
Who's leading you today? That's the Spirit's job in your life is to lead you. His job is to take you where you would not naturally go. If you are a son of God, you will be following the Spirit. If you are a child of God, you will be led by the Spirit. You don't get up every day and do your own thing. You get up each day and say, Holy Spirit, here I am. Take me where you want me today. Brothers, it's the job of the Spirit. In Isaiah chapter 30, and I think it's verse 21, Isaiah said, there will be a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Turn neither to the left nor to the right. Now that was in the days of Isaiah. He was saying even in the days of Isaiah the prophet, the Holy Spirit was there. Oh, he was silent. He was behind. They couldn't see him. They couldn't notice his power, but he was behind them, guiding them. He would say, all right. Nope, you're going too far to the left there. Straighten up there, buddy. You're moving a little too far to the right. Speed it up a little bit. The Holy Spirit was behind them. It's amazing. If you have a dog and you ever walk the dog, isn't it funny how they will go out in front of you and every 10 feet they want to stop and sniff? Who has a dog? Am I telling the truth? What is it about a dog? I'm taking you out for a walk and you want to sniff everything that's around you. I can't tell you how many times I've said to my dog, Macy, go, hurry up. You don't need and jerk the reins, but she'll go 10 more feet and start, start sniffing. Why are you doing that? See, I just, I know it sounds silly, but in my mind, I see the Holy Spirit doing the same thing in the Old Testament. He's behind us trying to get us to take a walk. And ever so often, we want to stop and sniff the world. I don't know what it is about the odor of the world. I don't know what it is about the pool of this society, but we just want to stop and take a sniff and stop and take a look. But the Holy Ghost behind us says, get back in line there. You don't need that. You got saved from that. That disappointed you. That almost ruined your life. Pick your head up. Walk straight. Don't go to the left. Don't go to the right. Can I just submit to you that he has saved our lives more than we will ever know? That's what the Holy Spirit does. He leads. He led the apostles as they prayed, as the Spirit moved on them. He would say, send this apostle here. Go over here and preach. Do this. Do that. He leads. Keep reading. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. I'm going to have to take a moment here. <laughs> Do you notice that he says, God did not give us a spirit of fear. We are not in bondage. We've been set free because the indwelling Holy Spirit liberates us from the bondage of fear and the uncertainty of life. The Holy Spirit, ever so often, look at it, cries out. Isn't that amazing? We think that the Holy Spirit is that quiet member of the Godhead. I used the word this morning, demure, modest, quiet. I just want to be behind the scenes, we think he's saying. <laughs> I, I want to be anonymous. And nothing could be further from the truth. I'm reading something to you right now that ought to change your mind about every bit of it. Number one, he's an enabler. Number two, 
He will lead you. Number three, ever so often he'll cry out. That means, folk, listen to me, folks. There's something I can't explain here. This is God working on the inside of you. You, you cannot comprehend the work of God. It's not your feelings. It's not your emotions. It goes deeper, and it's, 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 it's greater than that. It's God the Father, God the Son, talking to God the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, and ever so often, the Holy Spirit just cries out. The Bible didn't say ever so often he whispers a prayer in the morning, or ever so often the Spirit will say this to the Father. No, no. Paul wrote and said, ever so often, the Holy Spirit just blasts out, Father! Father! You say, but I've never yelled like that. And that's why some of you are so miserable. You've tried to keep the Holy Spirit suppressed. You're too dignified. You belong to one of those churches. Uh, you feel it, but you can't express it. Ah, oh, it feels like... Uh, fireworks in your belly. It feels like goosebumps on your back, but you can't do anything because you're a proper Christian. And don't you know that when the Holy Ghost sees you in trouble, sees that you're veering off the wrong way, going down the wrong road, and he sees you depressed about your own inability to live right, he knows when you're down on yourself and you can't stand to be who you are. And ever so often, when he knows that your head is hanging and your heart is heavy, he just cries out, Father, this is still your child. They're going through a rough time right now. He can't seem to get anything out the scripture. He can't seem to get a prayer through. He's down on himself. He's lost every battle he's fought this week. But Father, this is your child. Lift him up. Hallelujah. Bless him. It's going on right now. Sometimes, have you ever felt like you would explode? That's the Holy Spirit crying out inside of you to the Father. Now, he has to use your mouth. But the Holy Spirit is always praying inside of you. I, I have to repeat, this is beyond human understanding. This is beyond words because you, we cannot comprehend God. But he took control of your life. He sent the Spirit into you. The Spirit abides. The Spirit resides. The Spirit won't let go. The Spirit knows what you're going through. Oh, hallelujah. He knows what you're going through. Listen to me, weary brother or sister. The Holy Ghost knows what you're going through right now. And He is able. He is an enabler. He is a comfort. He is a helper. And all you got to do, listen to me, is say, Father. He didn't say, Call him Almighty God. He didn't say refer to him as the great creator. He didn't say use all of his Hebrew names, Jehovah Nissi, Jehovah Banner, Jehovah this and Jehovah that. I'm not smart enough to remember all that stuff, but I am smart enough to know this. He's my father. I'm his child. He's my God. Hallelujah to God. I need to calm down. I'd be a much better preacher if I could calm down. <laughs> Verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. That's what I've been preaching on, that we are children of God. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. John the Baptist 
was referred to in the first chapter of John, the gospel, and said there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He was sent for a witness to bear witness of the light. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light, which is the true light, which lights every man that comes into the world. Notice John's job, witness. He was the one that said, folks, he's the one. I saw the Spirit descend upon him in the form of the dove, and the one who spoke to me from heaven said, upon whom you see the Spirit descend, this is he. Folks, I saw him. That's the Messiah. That's what a witness does. It says, I saw it. I heard it. I know it. So when the Holy Spirit bears witness with my spirit, he is essentially saying back to the Father, he's yours. I've been living in him a while. I've been working on him a long time. He's yours. I, I, let me preach a little bit. Sometimes he doesn't look like it. He doesn't act like it. He doesn't praise like it. In fact, he makes a mess of a lot of things. But I'm here to bear witness to you, Father, that this is one of your children. Verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered or explained or translated. I'm trying to get it across to somebody. When you're not praying, the Spirit is praying. He never stops praying. You talk about prayer meeting. You've got Jesus interceding day and night on our behalf. You've got the Holy Spirit constantly groaning within us on our behalf. That's prayer meeting, brother. And, and when you're not even thinking about prayer, the Holy Spirit is having a prayer vigil inside of you. It's a groan that goes on all the time. You can't hear it. You cannot feel it. It's, I tell you, it's a spiritual thing. It's the Holy Spirit. And he's groaned. Because you don't know how to pray. And you don't know what to pray. So he prays for you. And those times, have you ever prayed and you thought, that was a waste of time. I, can't, I don't know what to pray and I don't, know if, I don't even know if God heard me. You feel like prayer is a failure? Brother, listen to me. The Holy Spirit never fails. Because God the Father, look at it, verse 27. He who searches the hearts, that's God, knows what is the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Right now, while I'm preaching to you, you don't know it, but the Holy Spirit is praying for you. Why am I the only one happy in here this morning? I said while I'm preaching to you, the Holy Spirit is praying for you and the Holy Spirit is praying inside of you. You think you're just listening to a gospel message, but you don't know the camp meeting that's going on down in your soul in that unseen spiritual dimension. They're shouting and praising, hallelujah, and interceding going on like you cannot imagine with your own eyes and ears. God is hearing the Spirit as he prays for you. Thank you, Jesus. Now, I... I want to say this. Does anybody here today need help? Okay, then raise your hand. Raise your hand if you need help. Okay. So some of you don't need help. <laughs> Did I see correctly? I'm, does anybody up here need help? Some of you have two hands and you've raised your foot. That's why Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to help you. 
Here's what Jesus said. My Father will give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him. That's what He said. Another time He said, if you, being evil or earthly, know how to give, give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him. I'm not talking this morning about Acts 2 and the Pentecostal experience. I'm not talking about any of that evidence. I'm talking about the, the resident third member of the Godhead living in you, waiting on you to ask for help. If you're a Christian and you feel beat up and beat down, if you've got news that has destroyed you, if you're simply just weary and well-doing, if you feel depression gnawing at you, if your heart has been broken and your dreams dashed, the Holy Spirit has come to help you. Stand with me, please. It's that simple. You listen to me, church. Now, we were taught when we were growing up, you get in the altar, you had to beg. I just didn't have the strength to beg for all I needed. But when I got older, I started reading scripture, and I don't see that you ever beg God for anything. You ask. You ask. And somehow, some way, God does it. I believe the impediment we have, uh, the, I, let me say the hindrance, is that we are asking for help, but we want Him to help us this way. Right? I would like to invite you to toss away your this way. Be done with how you think it should be done or how he might do it. And say, help. And then walk out of this building believing that help is on the way. And that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or even think. According, listen, to the power that dwells within you. That's the helper. That's the Holy Ghost. That's the Spirit of God. It's in here now. Let's try it again. If you need help, raise your hand. There you go. If you believe God answers prayer, say amen. And I think I'm just going to try it. I'm just going to do it. What would be wrong with every one of us right now? Just rearing back and crying out, Father. Would you do that if I did it? Let's do it, Father. Father! I'll tell you something just happened up in heaven. Say it with me again. Father! Holy God. Holy God. Father, thank you. Move. Let us get out of the way. Let us remove ourselves so that the Holy Spirit may do His work inside of us. I ask it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Sing it, David.
Just remember, the greatest prayer you'll ever pray is help. That stirs heaven up. When they hear one of God's own say, help, all the angels get up and they put their swords in their sheath and they buckle themselves up because they're about to get an appointment from God to come down and do something extraordinary in your life. Help! Say it with me. Help! It's on the way. Hallelujah to God. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. See you tomorrow night at 7 for prayer meeting.